All right, uh, so today on this uh, lecture we're going to talk about what are the binary questions when we're performing an EFAST. Um, so bear with me because we're going to talk about several uh, compartments of the body and how that uh, decisions can be affected by your ultrasound findings. So uh, a couple things that I want you to remember is that ultrasound, especially in trauma, will not identify the primary injury. Um, however, it can identify the secondary causes of that injury um, with fluid in the abdomen, fluid in the pericardial sac, or thoracic fluid. It, uh, it also offers the benefit of determining if the patient's hypotensive due to heart failure. Um, it can also rule out pneumothorax as a, um, you know, essentially ruling out uh, um, tension pneumothorax as the cause of hypotension. So it can offer us quite a bit of information beyond just the um, basic is there fluid in the abdomen and what do we do with that. So. Here are the binary questions uh, I teach the re my residents are, um, that we should understand and that what we're looking for. And so um, we don't do real well, at least in emergency medicine, defining uh, what the FAST is. Uh, the FAST can be used in multiple things. Uh, you know, it, rep it means fo focused assessment with sonography and trauma, but we've extrapolated that in multiple hypotension um, scenarios. And, and our ICU colleagues have defined that better as just a limited abdomen, which we are technically, that's all we're doing. So just keep that in mind that um, not, it doesn't always have to be trauma that you do this in. Um, and sometimes we have to remember when we're talking to our colleagues that they may not understand when we say fast. Um, and we have to say it's a, there's fluid in the abdomen that's concerning. So, um, <clears throat> so my first question, is there free fluid in the abdomen or pelvis? Second would be, is there a pericardial sac fluid? Third, um, you know, especially in our elderly people that are in single vehicular accidents or have, um, have falls from heights, is there heart failure um, uh, in our patients um, that may be having some respiratory issues, uh, is there lung sliding, and is there uh, th free thoracic fluid? So those are our five questions, and we're going to go through each um, kind of schematic of how I think of it in my mind. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. I'm sure there's a lot of discussion on it and uh, can create further discussion. So uh, please let us know your thoughts uh, on this. So what are the indications? It can be a hypotensive trauma patient. It could be any hypotension. It could be undifferentiated hypotension. Uh, may, many of you probably heard of the rush exam, rapid ultrasound for shock. Uh, there's also the Trinity. Um, there's several names out there that essentially use um, uh, a component of the FAST to evaluate for hypotension. Uh, so don't be afraid to use this in your, your medical patients also. Um, and the key also in trauma is it's for blunt torso trauma. Um, it can, does have some limited use in penetrating, but uh, does not just due to the fact that a lot of those injuries may not hemorrhage extensively, uh, may not be as useful. Because remember, once again, you're not identifying that primary injury. So we're going to break it down in compartments. Uh, so essentially a FAST exam is looking at the heart, the lungs, and the abdomen. And so when we look at the heart, um, I kind of like to follow the schematic and think about it. So we want most of the time, or in, there's limited utility in normal tensive patients. So we're going to talk strictly about unstable or hypotensive or significantly tachycardic patients. Um, and don't forget, especially in young patients, tachycardia could be their first, fi their first findings of shock. So you may need to have a, a low threshold to perform this study. It doesn't mean that it has to happen on everybody, and we'll discuss that a little bit here in a bit. So we're going to look at the heart. And our first question, is there pericardial sac free fluid? Anybody that's hypotensive, I suggest looking there first. Uh, it can cause, it, it's one of the first spots you should look, and then I think the second is the right upper quadrant, which we'll talk about in a minute. So pericardial sac free fluid, if there is, yes, then you need to consider a pericardial centesis or a thoracotomy, depending on what their vitals are shown or maybe you need to go to the OR. And so, you know, kind of a simple directed question here. Um, if there's not pericardial sac free fluid, then you need to look for other causes of hypotension. So one of those other causes of hypotension would be, is there a severely decreased EF? Uh, if the answer is still no, you keep looking. You're obviously early on in the evaluation, so you're gonna keep looking no matter what, but at least can get you directed in the right uh, to what you need to do. So if there's a secre severely decreased EF, you need to consider starting an ionotrope. Uh, maybe they need more of a kick. Maybe that's why they're, they're down. Um, so you need to consider starting an ionotrope. And if the hypotension is resolved, then you can turn you other supportive care, continue to look for other injuries um, for what's happened. Now, if the hypotension is not resolved, you need to look for other causes of their hypotension. And that includes continuing with your EFAST exam. So uh, 
when you look at the thorax, we're going to talk about that next. We've got our two binary questions, and bear with me as we go through this, but first one is there thoracic free fluid. And if there is no thoracic free fluid, um, then you need to look for other causes of hypertension. But we're going to go down this route. So if it's present, you need to consider that chest tube. Um, and if that chest tube's high output, then they need to go to the OR. Um, I'll let you review the trauma literature as what that means, but usually it's um, high output is usually considered more than a liter out initially, or that they continue to have high output, I believe, greater than 150 cc's to 200 cc's per hour for several hours. Uh, but you'll want to look at your institutional guidelines for that. If they don't, if, they, if you resolve their hypotension, um, then you continue supportive care. If you haven't, then you need to continue to look for other causes. So our, secondary binary, our second binary question is their lung, sl lung sliding. Now, remember with lung sliding um, that the presence of lung sliding rules out pneumothorax. So we're going to come down here. We're going to look for other causes of hypotension. If there's absence in a trauma patient, um, you can't 100% say sure there's a, a pneumothorax, but it does um, increase your risk of that and increase it on uh, the um, likelihood on your differential. Now remember, just I want you to go back and watch the uh, uh, lung or thoracic um, video because there are other things that can cause that. And to remind you of that, that would be breath holding. It could be a prior pleuridesis. Um, and it could be a bleb in somebody in, with like COPD. So, but in a young, healthy patient or um, uh, high enough suspicion, uh, you need to put place a chest tube, and that could resolve the hypotension. And you're just going to continue supportive care. If it doesn't, then you need to continue to look on these patients. So then we come to the abdomen. Now, um, on a blunt, unstable abdomen, we're going to perform this EFAS, and we're going to look at the left upper, right upper and um, pelvis, I suggest you, your first view be the right upper quadrant because that's your most sensitive view, especially in a supine patient. If it's somebody that somehow walked into your ER, maybe try the pelvis first because that may be where your fluid is. Um, and you can, um, I believe we discussed that in the, or we'll discuss that in the lecture coming up about how to perform the fast. Now, if they are hypotensive and it's positive, this is where there's a little conflict. There may be some data out to say, um, that they may go to the CT because there's a lot of stuff that we can do with angio, uh, angiography now. Um, but I would tell you, uh, you know, my opinion right now of this is if they have refractory hypotension, you probably need to be considering laparotomy. If they do not, if you can at least stabilize them or improve them, then they may be able to go to the CT scanner um, and identify that primary injury and see what else there is available. Now, obviously, this is going to be depend on a lot on if angiography and other things are available so and especially at your institution now if they have if they have a negative um, scan or fast exam in the abdomen for free fluid and they're hypotensive uh, you still need to have high suspicion maybe they just haven't had enough there for your skill set to pick it up yet and I would re recommend that you continue your, your uh, resuscitative measures and then you repeat that fast exam in 15 minutes. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the fast exam has very limited utility in normal tense of patients. And uh, we're going to discuss that here for a little bit. Um, there, the reason why this is not that helpful is because it only identifies hemorrhage. It doesn't necessarily identify the primary injury. So somebody could still have a splenic lack um, with only a subcapsular hematoma or liver lack with a subcapsular hematoma and may not be able to see this. So they may still be sick patients and you're not able to see that um, because you're not identifying the primary injury. Now, if, if um, there's some older studies out there to show that if they're normal tensive, you could do some repeat blood work, you could do repeat ultrasounds, um, and that's up to you on, uh, uh, on what you decide to do. But um, I, I think that there is some value in repeating a, a, a fast exam it, from after an initial one. But I would never tell you, I would tell you that never does a single fast exam on a normal tensive patient stand alone. It either needs to be followed by a CT or it needs to be followed by a repeat fast and obviously an abdominal exam. And you can look at some of the decision rules on how you're deciding to image 
these patients, but I would say if you're doing an initial fast exam, you decide that you're not going to see TD abdomen, you need to repeat a fast exam again uh, in about an hour as long as they remain stable uh, to rule out any hemorrhage and also probably should include some blood work, repeat blood work with that. Um, now, depending on your ED um, or where you're doing this at, once you've decided to perform a CT of the chest, abdomen, or pelvis, or limited abdomen, pelvis, um, fast exam really has limited utility in a normal tensive patient if they have um, relatively uh, quick access to the CT scanner. Meaning that um, I've seen often that uh, we'll have a trauma case come in, we'll be in the trauma bay, everybody's ready to go, they say CT scanners ready for you and we say well we've got to wait till the fast exam is done. In a normal tensive patient don't bother doing that just get them over to the CT scanner it's not going to be of any clinical utility. Unless you're making a different medical decision off of it don't bother performing it. Um, and you should consider it you know like a DPL in my opinion, opinion. If you would do a DPL and then still take them to the, fa to the CT scanner I mean by all means um, I don't understand the utility of that but um, I would say if your CT scanner is readily available just take them over and get the scan uh, in a normal tensive patient. <clears throat> so if, and we're going to refer to that here, so if they have stable vital signs, if you're going to see TB abdomen, you can say, yes, I'm going to go to it. Is it immediately available? No. We'll perform a fast because if it's positive, you can go to uh, your nurse manager, you can go over to the CT and say, you know what, I know you've got a lot of studies coming up, but we need to get this patient over first and take them directly to CT. If it's negative, then you can wait CT, feel a little more comfortable, have a little bit more objective data saying, you know, hey, maybe this patient's stable for now. <coughs> However, if that changes, you want to reassess and start over with a, probably another fast exam and see if you need to go there quickly. Um, if the CT, uh, if we're going to come over here, and if you say, well, you know, based off of some of my imaging criteria or um, what you're deciding to do, you know, perform an abdominal ultrasound. If it's positive, you're going to say, yeah, go directly to CT again. If it's negative, then I would suggest repeating an abdominal exam and fast exam at one and even consider maybe a third one at four hours um, along with some of those uh, physicians that may be out there just uh, doing observation on some of their trauma patients. I think that's a good safe alternative personally uh, to, to help take care of these patients. But remember, if they have continuing abdominal pain, it is not a safe, safe uh, disposition. You still need to probably consider um, something beyond uh, just a fast exam. So this would be somebody that their pain is resolved and that uh, the fast ex is negative more than one time and after a period of observation and they have stable vital signs. Um, other times I would consider fast even in maybe normal tense of patients was if you had to try it, you had a MASH casualty uh, incident and you had to triage uh, multiple patients at once. Maybe somebody with borderline vital unstable vital signs so meaning, you know, the low, uh, low blood pressure, but still normal, maybe hundreds, uh, with a heart rate of 150 in a healthy person, you know, maybe their tachycardia is persisting or is maintaining their, their blood pressure. Um, and then especially in kids, you know, tachycardia should be your first uh, consideration that you have a sick patient and not waiting until they get hypotensive. And then also when maybe the CT scanner's down, maybe you don't have readily access because uh, there's another exam going on. Those may be times to help you triage it so that your trauma patient isn't waiting, you know, two hours for a, a CT scanner, especially as all of our EDs are becoming more and more busy. Um, so here's just a list of things. I'm not going to read them off to you um, of what the FAST exam and CT um, can qualify. But remember, the FAST exam is not perfect, and it's just to find the secondary, the secondary issues due to a primary injury that you won't identify the primary injury. It is nice because um, you can do it right there at bedside. However, it is very operator dependent and that will depend on how good uh, everybody's skills in are of how sensitive or specific that will be. A CT scanner um, obviously can rule in and rule out a lot of things um, and it's not operator dependent. It is going to be uh, radiologist dependent in their ability to interpret it for you um, or you to be able to look at that and unfortunately has a pretty significant amount of radiation. But I do want to remind you that even though in a, a trauma patient, although this is part of an ultrasound lecture, that a CT cannot diagnose all injuries. Um, that a patient that has, just like I said before, if you have a fast exam 
that's negative, you observe them and you watch them and they have continued pain and you repeat a negative and it's a negative fast, that is not sufficient to discharge that patient home. They need further imaging, they need further observation, whatever you're choosing to do. Um, same is true of a CT. A CT scanner does not pick up every injury. It still does not get all the hollow viscous injuries. Um, and if the patient still has continued abdominal pain, uh, they may uh, require observation. So I uh, hope to, I'm sure this will create a lot of uh, different thoughts and opinions um, on this, and I appreciate everybody's comments. Thank you.